Thank you very much, Brother Jonathan, and a very good evening, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. That command that's in our subject title this evening is found in two places in the epistles of Paul. It's here in that third chapter of the epistle to the Colossians, which we we read together at the beginning, and it's found earlier in the epistle to the Ephesians and the fifth chapter. Now, the thrust of the letter to Colossae is directed to the believers there at an appreciation of the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only so, but also to the implications, therefore, that that has for the saints in this their day of probation. And and when we say that, we also mean ourselves, obviously, by extension, in in our day of probation. Just just remind ourselves a few of the verses from, from the epistle. The apostle starts in the first chapter of Colossians, Uh, And at verse 12, he says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist, and he is the head of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the ecclesia, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So that's that's a profound statement, isn't it? It's the headship of Christ. And the elevated position he has as the head of the body, the ecclesia, being the firstborn from the dead and having redeemed his saints. And again, if we go forward to the second chapter uh, and verse 10, he says, Ye are complete in him, in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him by, in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And, and the apostle is at pains to show how that it is this sacrificial work of the Lord Jesus Christ that we have been associated with through baptism which has placed us in a position of subjection to his headship. And having made this this point, he begins his exhortation on its implication in that third chapter. When he begins at verse 1 to say, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, or set... Um, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of, of God, set your affection or exercise your mind on the things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. 
And you know, it's in the context of this subjection to Christ and our required response to that that the Apostle introduces types to us the types particularly contained within the roles of husband and wife, followed also, as we, we read together, by that of other family and ecclesial members. Now, in this epistle, he's obviously dealing with practical issues, isn't he? As to how the members of the ecclesia, in particular, here in Colossae, should behave and should work together as one body in Christ, with Christ as the head directing their every action and thought yet it's in this section that that we pick up um, our title for this evening verse 19 husbands love your wives and be not bitter against them you know in isolation this this may seem I suppose an odd command to us Surely, we would say, husbands love their wives. Why should they be bitter against the one with whom they have been joined in the presence of God? We suggest there must be something more, perhaps, to this than than meets the eye. Verse 12 uh, of chapter 3 speaks to the ecclesia and says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Mouths of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. And perhaps it is that in the context of the marriage here, The the command to love comes from this general uh, section, speaking of the love that the ecclesia need to show to each other as part of that redeemed body of Christ. It's evident, of course, because we are all of a failing human nature, that within any marriage relationship there is need for (laughs) long-suffering and forbearance from time to time. It's interesting that he says, do not be bitter, husbands, against your wives. And it's a word that's not used very often in Scripture. It's it's only used elsewhere, as far as I can see, in this um, translation, in James' epistle and the third uh, chapter. Perhaps we could briefly turn there. James 3, and and it's uh, in the section about the tongue it's first used in the 11th verse and in the context of our speech uh, beginning at verse 10 for context he says out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing my brethren these things ought not so to be doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter can the fig tree my brethren bear olive berries either a vine figs so no fountain can both yield salt water and fresh. And, and, and the word there, bitter, is the same that is exhorted to husbands in Colossians. And, and then he says in verse 13, Who is a wise man, endued with knowledge among you, let him show out of good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, and that's that same word, Glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But, he says, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Uh, And we suggest that both these instances of the word perhaps show the qualities that are expected of a husband in relation to their specific treatment uh, of their wife. (coughs) That of long-suffering, of forbearance, of gentleness, mercy, and peaceableness 
based upon righteousness. The husband, we could say, is therefore exhorted to show the divine character, in particular, in his marriage relationship. Just as all brethren and sisters are required to strive to do so within the broader context of the ecclesial life. And given that the the marriage state is introduced to us in Scripture as a type of the relationship between Christ and the ecclesia, then the command to love one's wife and not be bitter against her perhaps takes on a new depth of meaning. Uh, and this really takes us to the other area where our title is, is uh, recorded for us in the scriptures, and that's in Ephesians in chapter 5. The link, of course, is, is, is that mystery which, which the apostle speaks of in verse 32 of, of chapter 5. This, he says, talking of marriage, is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the ecclesia. And he goes on to say, of course, afterwards, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. <coughs> and it's in this fifth chapter that we perhaps have a more in depth exposition of the intent of this command of the apostle for husbands to love their wives. So, what we want to do is, is take a, a few moments to Just walk through the relevant section of the chapter. It's one, no doubt, that we know well. It's often quoted when we attend the marriage of brethren and sisters. And uh, I want to start at verse 25 of of chapter 5. This is the, picks up the, the thread of our subject this evening. Verse 25 of Ephesians 5 Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the Ecclesia and gave himself for it. (coughs) And you know, this first statement here has to perhaps be amongst one of the most profound explanations as to the typology contained within the joining of a man and a woman in marriage. Just, Just keep that scripture in mind and come across to some of the words of the Master in in John's Gospel record. Um, We're going to keep your finger in in Ephesians, and we'll we'll go to John chapter 15 from just one verse. Christ is commanding his disciples to love one another in the same manner in which he has loved them. And in verse 13 of, of John 15... Christ says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And then just go back a few pages to John chapter 10. John John 10 and verse... 14. Well, the master says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So, when we look at that verse in Ephesians chapter 5, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the ecclesia, and gave himself for it. What he's saying is that the love within a marriage, as expressed by the husband, should be equated with the love of God shown in the willing sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the whole purpose of that love was not the death of Christ as an end in itself, but rather that through his death, he might bring life and immortality to light for his ecclesial bride. And the giving of the life of Jesus was not just a single act, was it? It was an act that involved many years of discipline under the hand of his father. 
Many years of preparation, of denial of self, and of willingness to empathize and to t- empathize with and to teach his disciples, those who would be taken out of his pierced side as his, his saints, just as Eve was formed from the rib of Adam back in Genesis. And when we stop and think about it like that, there's a great profundity, isn't there, to these things. And there are two reasons given as to why we're instructed as husbands to love our wives in this manner. If go back into Ephesians 5 and verse 26. Firstly, he says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Christ immersed his disciples in the teachings which he gave them. He was, as, as the Apostle John says elsewhere, he, well, he declared to be the, the word of God made flesh. He was the very embodiment of the mind and the purpose of the Father. And as such, his teaching and his sacrifice was able to cleanse them and us from sin. And so in giving himself, he gave himself that he might sanctify and cleanse his ecclesia with the washing of water by the word. And that's the example that is given to husbands. And then secondly, in the 27th verse, we read, that he might present it to himself a glorious ecclesia, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so again, the apostle is saying that not only was the motivation behind Christ's love in giving himself, that that of wanting to be able to cleanse his disciples from sin, but he also desired to present them complete to his father as a fitting and an eternal companion. Ultimately, as a community at one with God himself. Just go back to John's gospel record again. Keep your fingers here in in Ephesians. uh, And this time the 17th chapter. We're here just before the crucifixion. And the hours before. And the Lord is praying to his father. And he prays in verse 11 of John 17. He says, Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So the Master is praying for his disciples that are going to be left in the world, that they may be one with him and with his father. And again he said at verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then at verse 21, that they all may be one as thou father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And so here's the the statement then, the statement of the master before his sacrifice as to the desire he had for his disciples, his future ecclesial bride, that they may be one with his father, that they may be presented as one to God. And to inherit divine nature, there must be perfection, mustn't there? The father cannot behold sin, and the sacrifice of Christ has provided the covering which will make this all possible. 
And in the perfected community of immortalized saints, there will be no blemish and no spot. These things, of course, were were prefigured, weren't they, in in the law, in the sacrifices given under the law, when the, the animal brought had to be seen to be without physical blemish, to be acceptable. In the law concerning the physical attributes of the priests who would minister before the Lord. And these things are typified, the Apostle tells us, in marriage, in the responsibility of husband and to his wife. Can we go back to Ephesians 5 and verse 28? So, he says, ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh but nourisheth it and cherishes it, even as the Lord the Ecclesia. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And in the context we are considering this evening, in that of marriage, surely this makes all of us, husbands or prospective husbands, stop and realize just how far short of the stature of Christ we really come. We are instructed that we ought to love our wives in this manner, in the way that Christ loved us and gave himself for us, in the way that he still oversees the ecclesia which is purchased by his blood and intercedes for them before his Father in heaven. He sees his disciples, we're told here, as his own body, as his own flesh and bones. And of course this is language which takes us right back to Eden once again, doesn't it? To the formation of woman out of man. They were of one flesh and of one bone. And ours, brethren, is to show that same love to our partner, to nourish to cherish our wives in spiritual things, preparing them with us for the glory to come. Can you not feel the weight of responsibility that that places upon our shoulders when we stop to consider what the word's trying to tell us, brethren? It's a very serious thing, isn't it? For this cause... The Apostle continues, Shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh? This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the Ecclesia. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. Now tonight is not about specific practical advice for our success in marriage as such but suffice it to say that the scriptures show us that our principal aim in marriage must be to support and to encourage one another and for the husbands to work together in the truth in the word to encourage toward life in the kingdom What we are trying to do is lay the spiritual foundation from the word. Paul, in explaining the care of the ecclesia that he so keenly felt, used language which relates to this marriage state. It's in 2 Corinthians, perhaps we can go there, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. It says to the brethren and sisters there, that I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And this depth of feeling, this, this jealousy related to their spiritual development 
And it was in the expression of his fear for the Ecclesia's eternal well-being. And in this we therefore see a husband's true love. And a responsibility for all of us who would take on this role. That it is our responsibility to do our utmost to encourage the uh, sister wife in the things of the truth. That she may with us be presented as that chaste virgin to Christ. Just as the apostle had that care over the ecclesias. The apostle Peter also speaks of this most special of typical relationships in his first epistle. It's 1 Peter and chapter 3. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. Where he says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, the wives, according to knowledge, giving honour unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, brethren, that type that we've been considering so far is a very high ideal, isn't it? Those who take on the role of husband in marriage need to strive to demonstrate, as we've said, the love of Christ in giving themselves for their wife. The love includes and involves forgiveness. It involves understanding the needs and the shortcomings of the wife. It involves teaching and direction in the things of the truth. It requires a united life based on the inspired word of God and focused on the coming kingdom. And it involves being united, as the apostle says here, as heirs together of the grace of life, of the covenants of promise. If, the apostle says, our prayers to the Father through Christ are to be heard unhindered. But brothers and sisters, let us not forget the fact that a type as presented to us is just that. All of us will fail to demonstrate the true principles to perfection just as a type is not the reality. Only the antitype, the Lord Jesus Christ, could perfectly and completely give himself as the one true sacrifice for his ecclesia. And no matter how hard we try, brethren, we are not perfect and we are not sinless. We will never be able to fully show the love of Christ in our marital relationship. And we also need to recognize this. We need to remember that in our position of relative authority, divinely appointed headship within that marriage relationship, that we are at the same time as members of the ecclesia, a type of the bride. We needed and we still need forgiveness for our imperfections. And we just want to, for a few moments, think about the following statements and passages in relation to, our, to the husband giving, or the giving of Christ as a sacrifice for sin. Because I think it needs to put the husband's responsibilities and relationships in, in context. Romans 5, perhaps we start there. It may seem very obvious, but the scriptures explain that Christ died for us. That's the type, isn't it, we've been considering. Verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 
And if we put this in the context of our marriage type, we see the, the strength of the love of Christ and of God in that he was willing to lay down his life for those who um, were sinners. And brethren, we are included in this, aren't we? We have been justified through the blood of Christ and will be saved from wrath through him. And how, we may ask, it's if we seek those things which are above and let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, as we read in Colossians. The second point of consideration, perhaps, is, is that the scriptures present to us that as members of the Ecclesia of Christ, we are all one in relation to our salvation. Um, Galatians. Galatians 3, verse 26. So familiar to us. We, ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And you know, brothers and sisters, the covenants of promise referenced here that we become heirs to transcend all the other types and relationships within Scripture. When you consider it, marriage is a type of a means to an end and not the end in itself. Else why would Jesus state to the Sadducees, ye do err not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Yes, you see, marriage is a type of the development and preparation of the ecclesia of God for the final consummation. That, as the apostle says, we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and that ultimately God may be all and in all. And so while we need to show forth this type in our lives now, in this time of our probation, we need to recognize that it is a type of that process of deliverance for the servants of God and not fully a type of the, the kingdom itself where there will be no marriage for God will be all and in all. And the final point to consider in the way in which we conduct ourselves, brethren, as husbands, in giving ourselves as Christ did, is we need to remember that all of us are enjoined to esteem one another better than oneself in Christ. The epistle of Paul to the Philippians, isn't it? Philippians 1, I'm going to go in at verse 29. It says, Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me, and now here to be in me. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, 
that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so the equality of salvation and of hope within the differing roles of brother and sister, of man and wife, or as the ecclesial family, should never be overlooked. Particularly, we say, in in the marital relationship. And the ideals are, are very high. But the ultimate reward is disproportionate to any effort that we may expend in this regard. The principles are there for our learning and our admonition. And brethren and sisters, there's an addition... In addition, a great temporal blessing to those who will strive to enact these types within their marriage now. For the companionship and the unity of purpose will be a strength and an encouragement, just as the wise man in Ecclesiastes said, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. But we should also state be very careful to say that these things are not the be-all and end-all of discipleship, are they? If our lot were not to be married in this life, that does not make us somehow incomplete before the Lord. Marriage, yes, is ordained of God, but it is not mandatory for salvation. And as the Apostle Paul advises elsewhere, it is in itself a potential barrier to spirituality, at times, if we are not careful. Our time's moving on. We'd like to just briefly think about a few examples of husbands and wives from Scripture to consider the outworking of the types in their recorded lives. And start with, we want to return to the statement we made that the husband should display the divine character in his marital relationship. You know, it's the Lord God himself presents to us the role of a husband in the fact that he became a husband to his chosen people of Israel. Can we go to Jeremiah's prophecy, please, in the third chapter? Jeremiah 3 and and verse 14. He says, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you, one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it's interesting to ponder on the fact that whenever the Lord declares himself to be the husband of Israel, it seems to be in the context of his forgiveness of their waywardness and of his nurture and encouragement so that he would be able to ultimately bless them. This comes out in Jeremiah 31 when he speaks of the new covenant, when he will remember their sin no more. And it also comes out in Isaiah, um, chapter 54, and verse 4. Fear not, he says, thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord has called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. And so, brethren, again, Remembering that we are also of the bride community, here we have food for thought in our role of spiritual support for the ultimate good of our bride, just in the way that the Father has worked in the lives of his children of Israel. You know, in the lives of the patriarchs, we see perhaps particularly in Isaac and Rebekah the force of a true marriage. Isaac gave himself for Rebekah. He prayed for her. He instructed her in the things of the covenants of promise and entreated the Lord that she might be in the line of the seed once her barren womb should be opened. And her response, she was a comfort to him all his days. 
They were indeed joint heirs of promises made so directly to them. But we see also in the lives of other patriarchs the weakness of human nature, which could break the true type. Think of the conflict of interests between Isaac and Rebekah when it came to blessing Jacob and Esau. Think of the times when Abraham and Isaac denied their wives because they were afraid for their own lives not quite able in faith to lay down their life for their brides. Genesis 26 says, It came to pass when Abraham had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw, sorry, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah his wife. Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety she is thy wife. How said she is, now she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. These things, brethren and sisters, are written for our learning. We should not be overwhelmed when we realize that we have stumbled and fallen short of the ideal, but rather that we should be comforted, that we should be corrected in measure and restored on the path of life. Brethren and sisters, husbands and wives, we do well to reflect on these when perhaps we are tempted to be less merciful than the Lord would have us to be, even if that's only in our hearts. And just one more before we conclude, perhaps another example of a scriptural husband, that of Elkanah. Now we're told in Samuel, the first Samuel chapter 1, that he loved Hannah. He provided for her a worthy portion because he recognized that the Lord had shut up her womb. Here was a husband trying his best to encourage and to nurture his wife in the things of the truth. Even though she had not been blessed with children by the Lord. And in faith, Elkanah tried to fulfill his role. Yet he failed to fully understand the grief of heart that Hannah felt. And you know how truthfully it is that the scriptures demonstrate all aspects of our experience. Speaking to husbands, we will never fully understand the minds of our wives, will we? Neither will the wives fully understand the minds of their husbands. The type itself has limitations, but here in the marriage of Elkanah and Hannah, we see that this lack of comprehension did not destroy the type completely. It did not drive bitterness and division between them but they overcame together through the faith that they shared. Even if that were to mean the giving up of the son that Hannah had so learned for, both she and Elkanah together were united in his dedication to the service of the Lord. And that's an exhortation to us all, isn't it? And it takes us back to that in Colossians, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now we've considered this evening just one side, really, of the marital relationship. And and it's possible that the balance may seem to have been missing somewhat. And next week, no doubt, there will be a redressing of that balance as we consider the counterbalance, which is the role of the wife. But what we've tried to demonstrate are scriptural principles and types that apply to this most special of divinely appointed roles. That of the husband. As we said, this was a role first appointed by God to Adam. It was a role demonstrated by God himself to his chosen people. And it is a role perfected in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. As brethren who may take this type to ourselves in marriage we have seen that it is but a type of Christ's work. And therefore the ideal is a high one to try to attain. We have to, as we strive to show that type in our marriage, remember that we are also members of the ecclesia, the body of Christ, his bride. And therefore are required to recognize our own shortcomings and the ultimate equality which exists in the purpose of God which calls us to be partakers of the divine nature. 
but we suppose the ultimate lesson of our considerations is that husbands need to express their love in a true self-sacrifice for the sake of the salvation of his wife. And love in this sense does not have an ethereal quality. It's not just a, a niceness of spirit and a demonstration of simple kindness to one for whom we have an attraction and affinity. But it is a profound expression of a desire for the well-being of one with whom we have become as one, joined together by the Lord. It is a state whereby both husband and wife are truly heirs together of the grace of life. 